Good morning. The scripture reading for this morning uh, comes to us from the book of Psalms, chapter 25, verses 1 through 5. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day. Yes, I am not Scott Beyer. Scott will have his time before you this morning, as other men will as well, uh, as beginning uh, to kick off a new year. Several months back, uh, the elders met with some men and their wives, and they wanted to put together uh, some list of some possibilities of what we want to focus on for this year. And they presented that to the shepherds, uh, John Bingham and Scott Boatwright and myself. And they have developed this, and so we're going to let these men present this to you. Uh, we are very excited about it. So many good things are going to happen in 2023 here. But they're not going to be good if you're not here. And so we just want to encourage you to be here, to be a part of it, to take place in all of the activities that we're going to lay out for you, as many as you can. We just know that you'll benefit by doing that. So the order is we're going to have uh, Scott Beyer come up and speak a little bit. We're going to have Corey present some things. We're going to have Josh Smith present some things and then Steve Akers present some things. And then I'm going to get up here briefly before Scott gives a abbreviated sermon. And we're going to sing the song that we have uh, picked as the theme song for this year. And it's basically called In Need. I hope you got the email this week. We encourage you to listen to it so that you might learn it. Uh, so that we might uh, have an opportunity to do that. And Patrick is reminding me, is there anyone who has not received this booklet this morning? If you haven't, raise your hand, and we'll get some guys to that. Uh, a lot of work went into putting this together, and so keep that as a resource throughout the year. Um, it will give you everything that you need to know. I'm going to turn it over to Scott right now. morning. We have got a lot of really great things to talk about here. Uh, our vision for this year is every soul needs a home. In Mark chapter 8, verse 37, Jesus will pose the question, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is the price tag you put on your soul? Specific. Specifically, what would you value your soul at? What's your current trading value? I fear we often set that price tag far too low, folks. And that's the goal this year, to put it where it ought to be. This year, we're going to reset the value of souls to its proper biblical estimation. Last year, we focused on seeing Jesus and seeing his value, his eternal, immense, infinite value. And this year, we want to see our value. To him. In the last few weeks, we as a congregation, I want you to pause for a moment and realize what's happened. In the last few weeks, we have lost both Reggie Robarts and Mabel Largent. Those are not small names. They have both passed away. But none of us, none of us believe that they are truly gone. We simply say they've gone on to their reward. That's soul language. That's the value of the soul. It's eternal in nature. You have a body, but you are a soul. We want to become intimately aware of our worth this year. More than just that, we want to understand how our souls work. Because it's obvious in the world around us, that we don't understand how our souls work, and we abuse them, and we let others abuse them, and we mistreat them. If you look in Mark 8, 
Jesus mentions some surprising details about how to preserve a soul. In the exact same area where he says, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? He talks about how you have to take up your cross and deny yourself and sacrifice worldly goods and be unashamed of Jesus and be unashamed of his words in the midst of a society that is sinful and addicted to self. These are the types of behaviors that Jesus tells us cause a soul to flourish. When you feed your soul, it often will feel counterintuitive. The things that are good for it are oftentimes the very things that you find yourself not wanting to do. We want to learn how our hearts tick. We want to learn how to renew the inner man day by day. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to spend this year talking about what every soul needs. We're going to spend the first quarter talking about how every soul needs God. The second quarter, talking about how every soul needs truth. Third, how every soul needs purpose. And the fourth, about how every soul needs hope. And I will emphasize, each of those are needs, not wants. There is a difference between the two. Biblically, I will prove to you, this is my promise. I will prove to you, sermon by sermon, that you need God. You need truth. You need purpose. And you need hope. And we're going to look at that month by month. And there's a, a general feel to each quarter. The first month of each quarter will focus on what are we talking about? Why do we not need God in, in quarter one? The second month will focus on why so many people, if we need something, why is it so often that we don't get that need fulfilled? What is it that the world is doing? And when we say world, I sometimes think that that is us just avoiding the obvious. It's not just the world, it's Satan. Why is it that Satan has done such a good job of keeping us away from the things that our soul needs? And then the third month of every quarter, we'll spend some time specifically focused on application in our own lives. How do we do these things that we talk about theoretically? Because if it just stays on the page, what good is it? Christianity is not meant to be just studied. It's meant to be lived. Um, <clears throat> we're going to look at all four of these categories and month by month look at what they are, why those needs are often difficult to meet, and specifically how God shows us to meet those needs in our own lives and fulfill those needs for others. Folks, what this is is just simply a plan. We're going to go to this book, and we've got a plan to apply this book. Because just like Nehemiah, when he went to rebuild the walls, you better have a plan. Otherwise, you're not going to have the material when you need it. You're not going to have the workers when you need it. We want to look back at the end of this year and say, this is a year we made a plan. And then we worked the plan and we bore the fruits of that plan. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Corey. who will talk about some specifics with classes and integrating those. Thank you for that. <clears throat> every soul needs a home. Our theme in 2023 of every soul needing a home is expressed in the class offerings this year, and we're very excited about the class lineup. Page nine of the plan booklet, if you have that, has this same information you see on the, so on the slide, except for the class locations for the first quarter, and, and we'll review those, and those will come common knowledge. But in our focus on what every soul needs this year, we will be spending time in the themes of peace, truth, and personal faith. We will be looking at the early church, we'll be looking at letters to developing churches, and efforts made to start new churches. A study in Ecclesiastes will bring some of the more eternal questions of our ultimate home to bear as we lead lives that will hopefully lead us to heaven. There's a lot to look forward to this year, a lot to look at and apply it to ourselves, to our families, in our homes. We will, of course, continue with our trusted process of rotating teachers between the auditorium and the large classroom to ensure that folks can experience both of the offerings. But I want to point out this year also that the elders have undertaken two specialized classes that will prevent some parents from attending one or the other Sunday classes in the first and second quarters. But it's for good reason. Those are the, the parenting classes in, in quarter one. A parenting class on training older children will take place. 
And in quarter two, a parenting class on training younger children will take place. Both of these classes will be held in the small classroom in the back, and they are meant for the parents of children in these age ranges and will only be taking place in the first and second quarters. But during the first quarter, the study of the early church in Acts will take place here in the auditorium and will be taught by Jason Crowell and Scott Byron. Alternately, the large adult classroom in the back will host the study of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and will be taught by Jeff DeHutt and Justin Sturgeon. On Wednesdays, David O'Banion and Mike Morris will bring lessons on Ecclesiastes in the auditorium here, and then Grant Corley, Nick Gilkey, Derek Davidson will speak on Philippians in the large adult classroom in the back. As I mentioned, the teachers will rotate at the end of March, so we want to be prepared for that. These classes will reinforce the theme of concentration on caring for every soul in this life and the next. Let's get ready for a great year this year with our Bible classes. Now I'll hand it over to Josh. Good morning, everyone. Um, I recently conducted a survey with kids at Eastland uh, in regards to VBS, and here are the results. Question number one, do you love VBS? 100% said yes. Would you rather clean your room or go to VBS? 100% VBS. Would you rather eat peas or go to VBS? 100% VBS. Would you rather eat ice cream or go to VBS? 100% eat ice cream. <laughs> After VBS. <laughs> These stats do not lie. Irrefutably, children love VBS. Um, this data is not open to for interpretation or debate. It's also not available to the public. <laughs> Seriously, though, <laughs> transition in there. Um, as children of God, we have the hope of a home with our Father, and that's anchored in His promise. Uh, the Hebrew writer calls that steadfast and sure. Our theme this year is we have an anchor, uh, and it will be, so have your calendars, have everything ready to go. That, the dates for that are going to be Monday, June 19th through Thursday, yes, Thursday, June 22nd. Um, that is a little bit of a deviation from, uh, from the past. So that'll be a Monday through Thursday event on uh, June 19th through the 22nd. Uh, we're going to be looking at the following Bible stories. Uh, for the kids in here, we're going to be looking at the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, going to be looking at Jonah and the whale. Going to be looking at Jesus and calling his fishers of men. We're going to be looking at uh, Paul's shipwreck and... Uh, hopefully tying this into what you just saw Scott present in terms of the theme uh, for, this, for this year. Um, we will also plan to have an informational meeting on Sunday, February 5th. Uh, and that meeting is to review the, the tasks that are needed, uh, to look at the timeline, answer any questions. Those of you that have participated in VBS before know that while it takes place, the culmination is in June, all the work takes place between now and then. Um, so we're going to meet after services on February 5th. If you're interested in that, uh, we'll continue to remind you. Um, if there are some of you that already know you want to be a part of that in some way, uh, feel free to let me know. I'd be happy to um, mark you down in permanent ink and uh, be happy to have you. If you just want to know how you can help, if you want to be a part of it uh, and you want to know how you can help, uh, please let me know, um, and definitely please be at the meeting on February 5th. Um, I think that is all I have, and at this time, Steve is going to come and talk about uh, the Bible reading plan for 2023. So, apart from Jesus, the most prominent uh, person in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. In fact, we read this morning in our Bible class in um, Acts chapter 17 that there were Jews in Thessalonica who were angry and they accused Paul of turning the world upside down. He did that by teaching the kingship of Jesus. And it was this kind of behavior that really sets him apart. His dedication of his entire life to preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. Not only that, 
he wrote 17 of the, or 13 of the 27 books of the, the New Testament that we know of. So who better to learn uh, about God than from Paul? As we pursue our knowledge of God, our knowledge of the truth, as we pursue finding our purpose for ourselves in this life, as we pursue a greater hope in Jesus, Paul is going to show us the way. So I'm excited to unveil to you today this reading plan, which is all about the writings of Paul. We're going to read not just Acts and the epistles, but we're going to read them in chronological order. So each individual passage is going to happen in the context of the story of Paul's life. Now, if that weren't enough, I have three things that I want to share with you today that I think will improve or maximize the benefit of this year's Bible reading. Number one, decide why you're reading the Bible. I know for me personally, in the past, I've tried to keep up with the Bible we're reading because I know a lot of people here are very dedicated to that. And there's a lot of conversations, you know, in the hallways between class and service. Uh, hey, did you read the, the Bible reading yesterday? What did you think about this? And I don't want to be like, oh, well, I'm a little bit behind because I never read any of them. Um, so you try to keep up as best you can, right? And, and any reason to read the Bible is a good reason. Reading the Bible is good for you. But motivation matters. Um, I'd like to read to you from Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, we'll read 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. I would suggest that a greater motivation for reading this year's by a reading plan is to get to know the Lord better. If that is the reason why you pick up your Bible every day, there's going to be a greater chance that you will stick to it. There'll be a greater chance that you'll get something out of it. Number two, consider getting your ears involved. Now, that's a weird one. What do I mean by that? Well, in the first century, we know that not everyone had a copy of these epistles, right? Uh, Paul would write a letter and send it to a church. He would send it to the church in Corinth or Thessalonica, and they would read it to the congregation. So everyone would sit in the congregation and listen. They would listen for understanding. They would listen for application. Now, reading is fine, and, uh, but we know that in Luke chapter 11, the Lord said, blessed are those who hear the word, who hear the word and who keep the word. It is truly a blessing that we have these Bibles, that we all have a copy and that we can read them. But if we don't read with understanding, if we don't read uh, with an idea of application to our life, it just becomes a mechanical thing. I know I have personally been reading books and I, and I get to the bottom of a page and I go, wait a minute, did I read this page? I know in my mind I said all the words that were there in the proper order, but I don't remember if I read it. So get your ears involved and listen for understanding. You may even want to take advantage of an app on your phone that will actually read it to you. Third thing, work the process and let the process work. What do I mean by that? Well, not only have we arranged the reading plan such that it is in chronological order, but there are some questions on page 15 of your booklet that will help you. Um, so as you read each passage, if you've read a passage in Acts, there's five questions here to ask yourself about that passage. If you're reading one from the epistles, there's another five questions here. I would suggest getting a journal, writing down your answers to the question, because there's something about writing things down that solidifies a thought in your mind. And since Scott uh, referenced Nehemiah earlier about a plan and working a plan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference Ezra, and we'll go to Ezra 7 and verse 10. For Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Look, we all, we all know the difference between short-term and long-term, and we probably all struggle with it, especially this time of year when we set as a um, resolution for ourselves to get healthier. You go to the gym, you work out hard, and what do you get the next day? You look exactly the same, and every part of your body hurts. And so you go, wait a minute, why am I doing this? But if you stick with it for a, a month or two, you stick with it for a year, it'll transform your body. It'll transform your health. The same thing is true of the Word of God. I read today's Bible passage. Did it make me any more righteous or any more holy? Did it draw me any more closer to God? I don't know. 
But if I stick with it for a couple of months, if I stick with it for a year, it will transform my soul. And so as we are collectively looking for that home that each one of our souls need, I would strongly encourage you to work the process and let the process work you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Phil. Just stand as we sing this. And as Grant said earlier, I know there's a lot of people in this congregation, in this building, that know this song. So I'm going to ask you guys to sing out a little louder so that everybody else can participate. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a lot of things going on this year. We haven't even talked about all of the things. So there's a certain amount of uh, just expect more things to, to kind of trickle out as opportunities as the, the days go on. But this morning, as we focus on God's Word, I want to spend a little bit of time being, being intentional about what we mean when we talk about the soul. Uh, Genesis tells us that human beings are made in the image of God. And that God took dirt, they breathed life into it, and Adam became a living soul. And that, unlike all the other creatures, Adam was different. And then God made someone who was like Adam. Made somebody from Adam. And she too had a soul, Eve. And their relationship with God was different because of that nature of them being made different. And we are their offspring. The scripture reading this morning was Psalm 25. 
And it begins with, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And then from there, that psalm goes on to talk about trusting in God because there are enemies that exalt themselves over me and how they deal treacherously. And then down in verse 6 and 7, the sins of my youth, and my transgressions, according to your loving kindness, remember me. Verse 8, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. There are, I'm going to summarize what the psalmist is saying. There are troubles outside of me that impact my soul. And there are troubles inside of me that impact my soul. There are enemies on the outside. And, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. And there is an enemy that I see when I look in the mirror. You, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. When we say that phrase, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul, what we're doing is we're emphasizing this idea that every soul has to be entrusted to something or somebody. Your life has value and you are going to trust it to somebody. And when you have enemies out on the battlefield, what you do is you start looking for higher ground. Right? You win the battle when you have the high ground. And so what does the psalmist do? He looks up. And he sees God. And he says, you're the high ground. Give me your word. Because it's the high ground. Protect me from my enemies. Because I know you're the high ground. Your soul is... Precious, but also quite fragile. It is a truth that sometimes we try and ignore. We try and act like we're tough. Right? Broad shoulders. I can handle it. I'll be fine. Anything wrong? No, nothing. I'm good. I'm good. And we say I'm good until we're broken people. We say nothing's wrong until there's nothing left. You, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul, is a proactive decision to say, I'm not going to wait until the end. I'm going to make a decision now to entrust my soul to God because my soul is a fragile, and precious thing. In the 68th Psalm, the 68th Psalm, verse 6, it says, God sets the solitary in families. It's a beautiful phrase. Depending on your translation, I think that's a New King James version. If it was King James, it'd be God setteth the solitarieth and the familyeth. But if you are reading maybe English Standard, I think it says God gives the lonely a home. And whatever translation you read, it's beautiful. And it also is an indication of the nature of us as human beings. You need family. You need a home. And you can act like you don't. But you do. You may have heard before the story of a, a study done back when you could do things like this. And it was uh, the ethicist had not come in and said, you know, that's really abuse. But they did a study of, of babies one time. And babies, and they told the nurses, take care of all of their physical needs. But that's it. And we want to see what happens. And so all of the babies in the nursery had enough food. Their diapers were changed. They were warm enough. And they all faced failure to thrive. Which if you as a parent have ever had a child diagnosed with failure to thrive, it's, it's those three words, four words, failure to, no, three, eh, can't count, failure to thrive. Those three words, those are hard. They're hard to hear. But there was one baby, there was one baby that wasn't failing to thrive. And they couldn't figure it out. All the other ones were struggling. 
And so they put a camera on. And it turns out that the janitor would come in and clean the floor. And that baby, their bassinet was right next to the door. And that janitor would open the door, come in, and knock the bassinet. And the baby would start to cry. And so the janitor would stop what he was doing. He would pick the baby up. He would rock it. He would swaddle it nice and tight. Get it calmed down. And then put it down back in the bassinet. And that baby was making. You need more than food and clothing. You are designed by God to need relationship. You are designed by God to need people. I find it astounding, one, that we needed a study to prove this to us. But I'll tell you the other thing I find astounding is that that's all it took for that baby. One janitor to bump the bassinet and 10 minutes of rocking them was enough to keep that baby's soul fed. Folks, you crave family. And God sets the solitary in family, gives the lonely a home. We want to, one, give that to ourselves. But I also want you to do some things this year. I want you to bump some people's bassinet. I want you to go out in your life, and I want you to run into some people. And I want you to bump their bassinet. Because they need family too. And I will tell you, Eastland loves well. You are good at it. You have big hearts, and I want you to use them this year, because every soul needs a home. God gives us the task of being his hands to set the solitary in family. In Romans chapter 2, verse 9, Paul would say, There will be tribulation to distress for every soul of man who does evil. There is a practical reality. That just like there's the enemy outside, the other enemy is the guy in the mirror. The, when you sin, you cause distress to your soul. There is a phrase that has been popularized of a victimless crime. Meaning you do something, everybody knows it's wrong, but nobody got hurt. So where's the harm? Romans 2.9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. There is no such thing as a victimless crime. There is only souls that are either helped by righteousness or hurt by sin. It's that simple. It's always been that simple. You go all the way back to the garden. Their souls are at rest in paradise. Or their souls are in distress because they did that which God told them not to. It's not any more complicated than that. We are people who need truth because our souls need it. Our souls need a blueprint. We've been designed with a purpose and a meaning. And so oftentimes we're like little children with forks who say, That little plug in the wall, this fork would fit Beautifully in there. This is our problem. We're always engineering new ways to be stupid. So you got to go back to the baseline, right? We got to go back to the baseline, and this culture goes nuts, and you watch the news, and you go, there's a new crazy thing I hadn't thought of before. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because if you know what healthy is, you don't have to worry about all the different forms of unhealthy. We go back to the baseline of truth. We go back to being people who simply do that which God has commanded us to do. Folks, your soul matters. And I will tell you, 
I'll tell you that God wants your soul. God wants your soul so very much that he sent his son. That's the valuation he places. That's not mine. That's not my estimation. That's what he says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We need to start living like we have souls. God values your soul. But I'll tell you, there's somebody else who also values it. And that's Satan. We are in a very real, real battle for souls. The world is the battleground. And the plunder is us. So God tells us, watch out for the enemies outside. Watch out for the enemy inside. And understand your soul needs to be fed. Now go bump some bassinet. With that, that's the lesson I have for you. At this time, we're going to have an invitation song. If you are somebody who is not yet a Christian, let me bump your bassinet for a second. You do not get to God without the crying first. Sin is a real deal. And on the judgment day, nobody is going to be able to say, but I didn't sin as much as that guy. I always have to point behind me because I realize when I point sideways, I'm actually pointing at somebody. So, and I didn't sin as much as so-and-so. That won't work. Prisons are full of people who say, I'm not the worst criminal here, but they're all there. You will not get to the judgment day and be able to wiggle your way out of it. There is only one way to be right with God. His name is Jesus. And the good news is he loves you. And you matter deeply to him. And he died for you. And he said, if you will be buried with me in baptism, just like I came out of that tomb, you'll come out of that water. All your sins are gone. I will have paid the price. If you are ready to become a Christian, understand there is no other way but him. But he is the way. He is the cure. If we can help you to obey the gospel, please come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song.